Hi everyone, welcome to this month's Be By Security online talk. My name is Rebecca. We're joined tonight by Kerry, who's going to be our senior producer, and Susie, who's our backup producer. And of course, we have Hamish on the line, who's going to help me out with all of those tricky questions. Now, before we get started tonight, this is just a quick reminder that we're starting to come into that cooler weather. And this time of year, there's a few things you need to do to get your hive ready for winter. Now, one is to check on those food resources of your bees. We're coming into a time when there's going to be less around. And so make sure that your bees have sufficient honey um, in their, in their uh, super. So we're talking three quarters of a box to get them through winter. If not, you may need to consider feeding them over that winter period. Now, the other thing to do right now is to do that last lot of hive checks before we go into that winter period when it's less, um, it's not as good to open your hive, particularly not often anyway. And that's for people in the southern part of Queensland and the southern states. If you're in northern Queensland, tropical Queensland, that doesn't count so much. We tend not to have those bigger drops in temperature, and so you can continue to check for most of the year. So during this time, make sure you go in there, do a brood inspection. In particular, look for any signs of AFB, even if there's just one cell that you're concerned about, send in a test. And the other one is that it's a great time of year to undertake a sugar shake or an alcohol wash on your bees. So if you're not sure about whether or not you can find your queen, go with that sugar shake. Otherwise, if you've got that confidence, go ahead and do an alcohol wash. And that will just um, check that we're getting lots of people out there looking for varroa mite before we go into that period of time when we can't look for it over winter. So those are just some of the checks that you need to think about doing before we go into winter because the nights are starting to get that little bit chilly and even the days are cooling off. Now let's move on to talk a little bit about the rest of the talks in series four. So tonight we've got a SEMA masterclass. 1st of June, we're going to be talking barrier systems with our special guest, Rod Burke. That's sure to be a really interesting one. Our 6th of July, we're going to be talking um, in depth about supplementary feeding, in particular, some of the more recent research about the exact percentages of sugar to have in your supplementary feeding, as well as the really key components around biosecurity about how you feed if you need to feed. And then come the 3rd of August, we've got the last talk in series four, and it may be the last one for a little bit from me. And that's going to be about how you can be involved in the Hive Surveillance Program in Queensland. And that's an important program we're starting to get up and running so that beekeepers can be improving our surveillance as a whole, and we can get a better idea of who's checking what and when, so we know what surveillance is being undertaken out there. So that's going to be a really interesting one as well. But let's get on to tonight's talk, which is all about Nosema. So let's start by what Nosema is. Nosema is a microsporidian, which means it's a fungus. So it kind of fits in the same group with chalk prune. Now, if you're reading the literature, you may find it also being referred to as a protist, and that's because it formally fit into that group, but we now know that it's more closely related to the fungus. And there's two species of Nosema, Nosema apis and Nosema serrana. Both of these tend to have very similar impacts on bees and they kind of act in the same way as well. So we're going to lump them together for many of the things we're going to talk about tonight. But where there's differences, I'll be very specific about whether it's Nosema apis or Nosema serrana that we're talking about. Now, both of these species infect, of course, our European honeybees, but they also infect Asian honeybees African honeybees and dwarf honeybees. And there may be other species out there that infects as well that we haven't recorded yet. So they're the ones we have a good feel for. Now let's start by talking about Nosema apis because this is the first in Nosema that we really had a good understanding of. Nosema apis originated in European honeybees in Europe and it was first really identified in 1906. So we've known about it for quite a long period of time. And they first uh, really noticed it in the Isle of Wight um, in the UK. And sometimes it's still called uh, Isle of Wight disease. And in the first really big outbreak, they noticed that around half of beehives dried out. So it was a pretty big impact at that time. And they also sometimes called it uh, spring dwindling. Uh, and that's just because it was usually in that springtime that the bee numbers started to drop off because of Nosema impacting on the hive. 
Now, Nasema serrana, on the other hand, originated in Asian honeybees in Asia. And it's only really recently that it's been identified in European honeybees. So it wasn't until 2006 that we had a, a good record, report of it being in European honeybees, but we think that it's possibly been affecting them for maybe several decades before that, and we just hadn't been able to identify it or, or um, detect it well. Now, Nasema serrana tends to have a bigger impact on bees than Nasema apis. And this is really what we'd normally expect from any disease that's more recently jumped into a new species. When diseases go from one species to another, the new species that they're infecting tends to be more seriously impacted than the one that they've come from, just because that new species hasn't had time to adapt to that new disease. And the other thing that makes Nasema serrana a little bit more difficult for beekeepers is that there are no specific, really observable symptoms that you can say from looking at your hive, ah, oh, I've got Nasema serrana. So that can make it a little bit more complex as well. So where do we find Nasema? Well, Nasema apis is everywhere, pretty much everywhere. <laughs> there's not really anywhere that it hasn't been recorded where there's European honeybees. Nasema serrana is almost everywhere, so it hasn't been reported from Western Australia yet, but every, pretty much everywhere else we have Nasema serrana as well. And Nasema tends to have the biggest impact in temperate climates. Now we'll go into this detail a bit um, more later, but the reason for this is because one of the major ways that Nasema spreads through the hive is through the feces of the bees that can't leave the hive to do cleansing flights. And so when there's a lot longer period of time when the bees can't leave, it allows the number of spores, the disease, to build up in the hive because the bees have to defecate in the hive for a much longer extended period of time. Whereas in warmer climates, they can leave most of the year and it reduces that buildup of the disease. So how does it affect our bees? Well, Nasema gets into the bees' digestive system, so their mid-gut where their digestion is occurring. And affected bees aren't able to produce uh, food for the brood or royal jelly. So what this ends up what ends up happening is that there are less bees in the hive that are able to look after the brood, and hence you can have less brood. Um, Infected bees also have difficulty digesting food and they also need more food. So they need have much greater energy needs. So they tend to be, you know, not as efficient as help for helping out the hive because they are constantly requiring a lot more food than other bees. Infected bees also have a shorter lifespan. So because they can't produce that brood food, they tend to skip over that life um, stage where they're in the hive looking after the brood and go straight onto being guard bees or to being foragers. And so rather than extending that foraging period, instead what seems to happen is that they skip that first stage and they don't get that time back. They still die earlier, so they have a much shorter lifespan. Infected bees are also more susceptible to other diseases. So Nasema uh, tends to suppress the bee's immune system and they can fall victim particularly to things like dysentery. And so overall, the whole hive has to work harder and there are fewer bees being produced and those bees, again, have to work harder because there's few of them. So when Nasema occurs, it can be a real um, burden on the hive if it gets to stages where it's quite prevalent. If the queen bee gets infected, it can be even more serious. And the queen bee, once she's infected, will stop laying eggs. She may slow down for some time, but eventually she stops laying. Um, now, it's less likely that the queen is infected than the other bees within the hive. And this is because the most uh, likely to be infected bees are the ones that are cleaning out the hive. So they're coming in contact with those feces that are inside the hive the most. So those are the most likely to get uh, diseased. So how do we get Nasema into our hive? How does the, the disease spread? There's a range of different routes through which it can get into your hive. So for a start, infected hives and equipment. If you've got hives um, or frames or bees that have come out of a hive that have Nasema, put them into your hive, you'll be bringing the disease with you. If this includes, includes tools as well, and it can to some extent include gloves if they get quite dirty. Uh, bees can also 
bring the disease in when they go to water sources that are infected. So if your bees go to somewhere um, to get a drink where an infected bee has come before it, they can pick up that disease. And there's also some evidence to, to suggest that they may be able to pick it up from floral resources as well. So some of those disease uh, spores have been found on flowers and been able to be transported by bees back to the hive um, after they've been picked up on flowers. So they could be getting it from infected food sources too. And of course, those terrible robber bees. Um, anytime we've got bees that are coming from another hive that could be infected into your hive, they can bring with them pests and diseases, including the SEMA. Same goes for bees that are coming into a hive through drift. So they have accidentally gone back to your back to the wrong hive after you know a hard day out on the honey, and they've ended up coming in, in into the wrong hive and spreading that mycena. So once inside the hive, um, the fungus produces spores in the gut, in the gut of the bees. Those spores are then spread throughout the, the rest of the hive uh, in the feces of the bees. Um, they'll contaminate the honey and they might also contaminate the water sources and continue to spread through those mechanisms. Now, it only takes two spores to cause an infection. Normally, it would take around 400, but it really, you know, you can get an infection with only two spores, so not much at all. And an infected bee can produce two million spores within two weeks. So you can see how it goes from just a few bees with a couple of spores to all of your hive with lots of spores very quickly if the circumstances are not uh, in favour. So let's talk about the symptoms of Nosema. Now, the symptoms for Nosema vary between Nosema apis and Nosema serrana. So Nosema apis has some quite identifiable symptoms. These include the most easily uh, to identify, which is dysentery. Now, as I mentioned before, Nosema doesn't cause dysentery, but it causes the bees to become more susceptible to secondary infections, and one of those is dysentery. And so you can see um, down the front of the hives on these pictures, uh, the bees have had dysentery and has, that's gone right you know, to stay in the front of the hive. So that's a pretty um, good way to detect it. It might also be inside the hive as well. So you might see those scenes from dysentery inside the hive. Other symptoms of Nosema include the bees crawling around the entrance of the hive rather than walking. And it also may be that your bees have their wings at very odd angles. So they'll be sticking out at right angles and that's um, caused by sort of a deformity of the wings. There's a few other symptoms in the Sema apis. One is that the bees may have swollen or greasy looking abdomens. So they kind of look quite dark and almost hairless compared to the other bees. And of course, low bee numbers or dead and dying bees around the hive is also an indicator that you might have Nosema. Nosema serrana, on the other hand, has very few symptoms that you could detect. Really, the only thing you might see are low bee numbers or dead and dying bees around the hive. Now, from listening to my previous talks, you'll probably know that low bee numbers and dead and dying bees is a symptom of almost all of the pests and diseases that occur to bees. So it makes it very difficult to narrow it down to being the Sema serrana. But if you ex, um, think that it might be, then the best way to go about it is to test whether or not it is. Now, in terms of the prevalence of these two different uh, species, Nosema apis can occur at any time of year, but it's more common in the autumn or early spring after those periods where the bees are going to be confined in the hive and they're spreading that Nosema through their feces, um, particularly if they can't leave the hive during that time period. Nosema serrana, on the other hand, seems to have fairly similar prevalence all year. So we don't have that same peak that we see from Nosema apis. So what happens if you see Nosema symptoms? Well, there's a couple of different routes you can go down. You can either send some bees in to be tested at the biosecurity laboratories, or if you're feeling really um, industrious, you may want to try testing for Nosema at home. So I'm going to talk about the ways to do both of these. Let's first start with how to send in a sample to get te tested for Nosema. To do this, you want to collect 30 to 60 bees, preferably 30. The more you can get, the better. From either, um, bees need to be either sick 
or recently dead bees. So we want the bees that are likely to have the pathogen so we can find them. And preferably from the front of the hive. So if you can get those sick or recently dead bees sitting around the front of the hive that we think, right, they're most likely to show the disease. Place those bees in a clean jar full of 70% ethanol and send it in with a sample submission form. And that needs to go into our biosecurity sciences laboratory. So that will be tested. Make sure that you fill in the sample submission form as completely as you have, can. If you have any difficulties with that, just give me a quick call and I can talk you through how to do that one. Now, if you're feeling like you, you know you want to really try um, doing this at home, um, you can test for Nasema or monitor for Nasema at home. And some commercial beekeepers in particular um, like to do this just to keep an eye on the levels of Nasema in their hives over time. It does take a little bit of skill and a little bit of equipment. Um, some of the things you're going to need, you're going to need a times 400 magnification microscope. So this is kind of falling into that um, student level microscope. So some people may have um, one of those or may be able to pick one up. You'll need some glass slides and some slide covers. You'll need at least 15 bees. Um, you'll need some sterile water and a mortar and pestle or a rolling pin to crush those bees up. And this is very similar to some of the things that we undertake in the lab as well. So this is kind of the same process that we do to test for bees in the lab which you start by separating the abdomen of the bees because that's where we want to um, locate the, the pathogen. And then take those abdomens and crush them using a mortar, mortar and pestle or a rolling pin with five mils of water. So in a little, make a little kind of a slurry out of the abdomens of the bees. Then you want to add an additional 10 mils to that mix so that we're diluting it out a little bit. Then take some of that liquid little uh, drop up and put it uh, drop on a slide and place the cover slip on top. Then you want to make um, examine it underneath the microscope. So a couple of tips for using a microscope. We need one that has at least uh, times 400 magnification. But remember when you're looking at your microscope that both the lens and the eyepiece will have some magnification. So make sure you multiply those out to, to get the right level of magnification. Now, also uh, a tip particularly for beginners using a microscope is to uh, use the knobs on the side to focus. You want to focus, bring the, the, the lens right as close as you can to the microscope side and then move away. If you go the other way around, there's always a big risk that you'll go without looking too close down to the slide and you'll break the slide with the lens by moving too, too close to it. So keep that in mind when you're using a microscope. You also want to have a microscope that has a very good light that comes from underneath so that you can illuminate those spores that you're looking for. So what are we looking for when we're looking down a microscope to try and find the SEMA? Well, what you'll see are little short cylindrical rods with round ends. And they should be around five to seven micrometers long and three to four micrometers wide. Now, if you look down, usually it's your right eye um, eyepiece, there will be a little ruler in there and you can use that to measure the size of them. Here's a few pictures of what it might look like when you look down there and you can see they're pretty nondescript. They're just little cylindrical rods. Now these ones have been labelled as N. serrana and N. apis, but it can be almost impossible to determine the difference between the two um, just by looking at, at the microscope. You can see here too that the outside of N. nasema spores are quite illuminated by the light. Um, that's another good way to uh, detect them underneath the microscope. And this one here, you can see the whole spore has been lit up. And so that um, difference between the lighter and darker areas is, is a good way to pick out the spores as well. So as I mentioned before, you usually can't tell which species of Nisema you might have unless you do a, a lab molecular test. So that one's not really possible at home. Uh, if you're determining whether or not you have Nisema at home, first start by determining if the spores are there which is what I just described. If you want to determine prevalence, it's much better, they found, to look at how many bees are infected rather than the 
the number of spores in your sample. So number of bees infected rather than how infected each bee is, i.e. how many spores there are. So when you're looking for prevalence of the disease, how, you know, how serious it is within your hive, collect bees instead from inside the hive rather than from the front of the hive. Now, the reason that we want to do this is because the bees that are at the front um, and that are already looking sick and dead are more likely to have the disease than other members of the hive population in general. So if we just take the ones from the general population inside, it gives us a much better, more accurate uh, evaluation of how many bees really do have Nacema in your hive. Um, and also keep in mind that bees that are in the very warmer areas of the hive, particularly you know if you've got a side that the sun's hitting, they are also more likely to be infected. So maybe think about taking some from that warmer side and some from a cooler side as well, if you think that's having a big impact on the temperature within your hive. So take those bees that you've sampled and you want to squash each of them separately and put them each separately on different slides. So make sure that you're not um, in getting any spores or any of the material from the first bee on the slide that you're putting for the second bee or the third bee. So be very careful about cross-contamination there. Otherwise, all your bees, are, you know, the first time you see it, you'll then see it in all the other samples because it's just been put on the equipment you're using. So then what you want to look at is what number or what percentage of the bees are infected. So if two out of 10 bees are infected, you say 20% um, of the hive is, and that would be a bit of a serious problem within your hive. However, keep in mind that you may need to test quite a lot of bees to get a good percentage um, value that's very accurate. The more bees you test, the more likely that accuracy is going to be. So to give you an example, if you wanted to detect a 5% infection within your hive, so an infection where 5% of the bees uh, are infected uh, with 95% accuracy, so you want to be pretty sure that you've got that 5% infection, then you'd need to examine at least 95 bees, which is quite a lot of work to undertake. So keep in mind that you know you need to do quite a lot of bees in order to get a good evaluation of the prevalence. Okay, let's move on now. We know you've got nosema or you don't have nosema, but let's talk about how you might prevent it for a start in your hive. And it tends to be weak hives um, that are attracting robber bees uh, who bring disease with them that tend to, you know, start the whole thing off. And so one of the key things to make sure you have is good bee husbandry, strong hives through good husbandry. So making sure you're leaving your bees with at least three quarters of a box of honey over the autumn and winter, feeding your bees if conditions are poor, reducing the number of supers um, when the number of bees is low, so over that winter period, requeening regularly, which is really important for Nilsema, um, every two to four years at least, and re replacing your brood comb regularly as well every three to four years, because those spores can build up in that brood comb and continue to infect bees in your hive. Of course, being a fungal disease, it's really important to keep your hives dry and protected from extreme conditions. And cane toads can actually spread Nacema as well. So make sure you're using cane toad excluding stands to keep those little buggers away from your bees. Now, managing Nacema, if you do find you've got high levels of Nacema within your hive, there's a few things that you can do. The first key one, of course, is good bee husbandry, making sure your bees are healthy, well looked after. Of course, changing out the comb to reduce the disease is quite important as well. Um, and also bringing new bees into your hive through stimulating brood production. So you can do this in a couple of different ways. Uh, Requeening is a good way to do that. So if, particularly if your queen is more than one year old, you can bring a new queen in and she will likely be more vigorous, produce more offspring, and that way you'll have more bees that are being produced at that stage that aren't infected until at least they, they um, come out. And so you'll be able to make sure you're starting to build up your hive a bit. And um, they've also found that uh, feeding concentrated sugar syrup can in time, at times simulate brood production as well. So you may want to consider that to try and build up your bee numbers. There's also been some evidence that providing pollen or uh, some kind of protein substitute to bees can reduce the incidence 
of Nasema in your hive. And that's probably, you know, partly because you're improving the nutrition and the bees are, are able to uh, perform much better. Of course, if you can detect where the water source for your bees is, um, and if you can then remove that water source, that may be a way of preventing that continual contamination and contamination of other hives as well, because those bees can spread Nosema at the water source. So if you can get rid of a contaminated one and provide a new clean water source, um, that might be a possibility. Of course, that's not always possible, particularly where that water source is a natural water source. And of course, ensuring your hive is in a really nice warm location. That means that the bees can leave more often and um, for a longer period of time during the year to do those cleansing sites. So it reduces that buildup of spores in your hive. Now, it's important to keep in mind that most hives have some level of Nosema most of the time. Um, it'll be at low levels. It probably won't impact on your hive. We tend to only find that you need to step in and start managing the SEMA when we start to see big impacts. So generally it's thought to be around 5% of your hive is impacted by the SEMA. It could be, you know, if it's much higher, you need to start to really be concerned. Um, and so if you hit that kind of threshold, consider then stepping in and particularly requeening your hive at that point in time. However, if you you know find you've just got a little bit of Nosema all the time, it's nothing really to be too concerned about because that um, Nosema is very widespread um, and tends to be in, in almost every hive. So what can you do to prevent spreading it yourself? What can we do to kill those spores? Well, we know that spores can remain viable inside bees for at least a year, so they can continue to um, produce feces with spores for that long. Um, and outside uh, bees for at least 10 months, probably much longer than this, but we know at least 10 months that can sit dormant in the environment. So just waiting it out isn't really an option. But what we can do, um, we can heat things like uh, hive tools and other equipment to 49 degrees Celsius and then hold this temperature for at least 24 hours and that will um, deactivate those spores. Gamma radiation is always also really effective at killing the SEMA as well. You want that 15 kilograms of radiation and you can do that by sending your hives or your tools or your suit or whatever you think might be contaminated to Steritech. Um, there's also um, an ability to use 80% acetic acid on things like tools to decontaminate them. And to make 80% acetic acid, use one part water and four parts glacial acetic acid. Now, remembering that it's, it is quite a strong acid, so keep it, that in mind when you're handling this um, to read the chemical instructions very carefully. Use gloves and other protective gear as well. And for that acetic acid to be effective, you need to leave those items for at least a week. So they don't just dip them in the treatment and go on with, make sure they soak for at least a week. And I also wanted to mention what doesn't kill the spores. So um, often people think, oh, but what about this? And um, unfortunately, there's always some, um, for every disease, there's some things that just aren't effective. And for Nosema, we found that low temperatures tend to just preserve the spores, if anything. Um, so, you know, putting something in the freezer is not going to get rid of Nosema spores for you. And high temperatures for short periods of time are also ineffective. So if we want to make sure that we're getting rid of it, we need to be holding it at that least 49 degrees Celsius for at least 24 hours. Now, I want to mention a little bit here about medication and treatment. Unfortunately, there aren't any treatments registered for use in Australia. Overseas, if you're watching YouTube videos or, or looking at some of the websites over there, you'll find that um, in some places, US in particular, and there's some special use in the UK, there's a chemical called fumigillin, fumigillin or fumigillin B. Um, now, currently, Generally, you need a, a permit, a special permit to use it in Australia. So generally, it's not legal unless you have a permit um, specifically prescribed um, to use it. And it's really only queen bee breeders that are able to obtain that permit. Um, and that's because uh, of the contamination issue with honey. So we don't want it going into just um, honey producing hives. And there are some really good reasons why we don't just use it to treat 
uh, Nassima in Australia. And that's because for a start, it doesn't really seem to kill the pathogen very well. It tends to reduce the symptoms effectively. But as we know, with um, things like uh, AFB, American Fowl Brood, um, sometimes when you feed an antibiotic to bees, it can mask symptoms, but then result in much higher levels of infection in the in the bee population over time. So it can build, pathogen can continue to build up and continue to spread. Um, but we're just kind of masking the symptoms very uh, over a short period. So it's not all that effective. Um, some studies have also shown that it can on its own cause mortality in bees, um, particularly the, the commercial applications of it. And so it can, you know, cause mortality as well. It's not been found to be very effective against Enserana, Zima Serana. Um, there are also widespread widespread counterfeit products that people really need to be aware of, and it can also contaminate your honey. So the chemical that's used in it um, is also used to treat cancer in humans, and so it has an impact on cell reproduction in humans. And so that's one of the things that people are quite concerned about. If it gets into honey, it might impact on human health. So that's one that we um, don't use here in Australia unless you have a permit and are a queen bee breeder. So just to summarise, um, hopefully what you took away from tonight's talk about Nasima is that it's very widespread and quite seasonally variable. Um, but if your hive seems to be being impacted, you're starting to see big losses from Nasima, you can easily test for it. And we can let you know whether or not you have Nasima. And to manage Nasima, you need to ensure that you've got good bee husbandry. Um, your hive's in a nice warm, sunny location, so keep it warm for as much of the year as possible. Requeening, of course, is important, as is swapping out your frames. So that's the basics of Nasima. Um, let's move on and see if we've got any questions that are going to come in on Nasima. Okay, we've got it. Oh, couple here. Um, uh, we've got one question here asking if you don't have ethanol, is there something else you can put the bee samples in? Maybe 70% methylated spirits. What do you think about that one, uh, Hamish? Oh, gee. Um, in the past, I have actually used uh, methylated spirits. I know. Um, some of the lab uh, preservation processes don't like it, but I think at a pinch, if um, if that was the only thing on hand, uh, it, it would do the job. Great. And Hamish, you've had lots of experience out there. I'm sure you've seen lots of hives with Nasima. Have you got any hints for beekeepers about dealing with Nasima? Oh, look, I think the old adage of just trying to um, to keep the bees in a, um, especially during the, the cooler months of the, the year, in a um, uh, a warmish um, and sunny site, that's sort of uh, where you'd start from. Um, and also not doing anything that's going to exacerbate the um, the stresses on the bees that if they do have Nasema, going from a, an endemic situation to an epidemic, uh, such as leaving too many boxes on the hives, um, trying to control their microclimate um, that's unsustainable, where the stress levels go up. Um, you always see in um, any sort of trials that bees, uh, um, research trials, um, some bees are put in um, refrigerated um, conditions and the Nasema levels skyrocket in those, those situations. So. Um, so it's important to try and um, be kind to your bees, basically, is the old adage, I guess. Thanks, Hamish. Yeah, it, it's a tricky disease because, you know, it's really just do do the right thing by your bees is, is the main way you can make sure that you can both prevent it and manage it if you get it. Unfortunately, we just don't have many other tools um, available to us to be able to control this disease. And I've read many things recently where 
they suspect that Nazima may be having a much bigger impact than we actually um, are aware of a lot of the time, particularly Nazima serrana, because it's very difficult to identify it because it hasn't got any of those really um, uh, clear symptoms. It could be in many more hives and being impacting more hives than, than we really know. So it looks like we haven't got too many questions online tonight. I'll just um, double check. I think we're out of questions. So uh, we might call it a close for tonight. Um, remember that next month's Be Biosecurity Talk is going to be on um, looking at barrier systems and that's really important for biosecurity that you consider having barrier systems in your uh, own hive at home, own apiary at home. Even if you've only got two hives, you can still have a barrier system in place. And if you want to come and see me um, in the pers in person, um, I'm going to be uh, next week, this weekend coming up in the Kingaroy area. So get in touch with the local clubs there if you're interested in coming along to a live in-person talk. And um, I will see you all next month.